Uh, right. Welcome all. This is a script. Uh, to the final event of this year's squad, it's a preeminent tutorial on timing. And I'm very pleased to introduce our tutor, uh, Peter Colleen. Uh, Peter probably needs no... Peter probably needs no formal introduction uh, to this audience as he is well known to members of the squad community for his quantitative theories in the areas of choice, reinforcement, timing, and perception. Also, as many of you probably now know, Peter is the new president of Squab. As of okay. yesterday. Yesterday. Now, I want you all to start taking orders as of today. <laughs> so, I'm not going to give a long resume on Peter, and in some ways, introducing Peter to this group is like introducing Tom Cruise to Nicole Kidman. You all know one another very well. And for the older folks in the group, uh, Elizabeth Taylor to Richard Burke. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be in Tempe with Peter uh, as the behavioral theory of timing was developed. And that particular theory of timing, it's one among many now, uh, was actually born during a drive from Tempe to San Diego uh, on a trip to visit Ben Williams. And by the time we reached the Pacific Ocean, we had developed the outline of the theory. And uh, it was a behavioral theory and that we viewed as a viable alternative to scalar expectancy theory. Um, on the drive home, after leaving Ben's wine supply much depleted, uh, we worked on filling in the details of that theory. And I've really never, ever had a more scientifically productive vacation. That's good. Uh, Peter will now tell us how to parsley sage rosemary's thyme. So the question is, what is time that we can buy it, find it, bite it, give it, kill it, in the right order, and measure it? It's a strange beast, especially when you think of measurement, because measurement historically means putting things, two things side by side and seeing if one sticks over the edge of the other. But these are both accomplished facts. How can we put the past decade in correspondence with the past day. And even if we were to do that, how could we say that they're about the same length in time, that one only seems like uh, the other? What I'd like to talk with you about today is time. To a certain extent about how we model it and measure it and think about it, why it's so much fun and why it seems to be so hot lately. But if you really want to get a good take on it, you should pick up the last two issues of behavioral processes and also the uh, penultimate issue of JAB, where there's a lot of good discussions and great insights about models of time, most of which I won't have time to go into here today. What I will talk about is the nature of time, and my emphasis here will be on the fundamental relativity of time. Then I'll talk about behaviors time. I will talk briefly or not at all about what models are good for, as time allows. A few models of timing, some data, and then some of my recent work that I find, of course, interesting and might like to share with you. So what is time? Time is the dimension along which structure expands into function, attitude into action, stance into behavior. Along this dimension, a snapshot becomes a movie a persuasion, an action. A posture becomes a response. I will be giving successive descriptions of time. And each of those will carry us, hopefully, to a slightly deeper level of what I mean by time and what I hope you come to mean and understand as time. It's a curious piece because we never see it directly. Time is the context, not the content. It is en enigmatic because we're looking for things rather than things that hold things. There are many scales of time. It's a complement of things that evolve according to different scales. Stars inform us of cosmic time through their redshifts. Rocks of geologic time through their sequential strata. Calendars inform us of a historic time by counting the number of revolutions of the Earth around the sun, and clocks of daily time because they count the number of rotations of the Earth around its own axis. 
in general, thing z informs us about time sub z. And the notion that this t is common amongst all of them is something of an act of faith. It's more than an act of faith. It's, it's a continuing performance, because all of these are recalibrated against one another. Redshifts are re, uh, resized, strata are resequenced, carbon dating is adjusted, calendars are reformed, and clocks are reset. All of these things are done to maintain a network of overlapping consistency. And this is what I mean by constraint satisfaction, that time is manufactured out of many things that evolve with the goal of maintaining a common T that we can apply to these various events that evolve through time. So what is the nature of the information uh, that clocks give us? They what they do is they point to events or to labels and tell us where we are in their order of sequence. To keep these organized, we use labels like the subscripts on that line. The labels are more convenient if they have intrinsically ordinal properties. So it's easier to know that 430 comes after 415 than it is to know that Jurassic comes after Ordovician. Or does it come before it? I never have that right. So numbers are better than names. But if you're interested in time, you're interested in change. And the question is, how do things change with time? Um, if clocks point to labels, what happens between the labels? How can we translate a sequence of ordinal points into a simple continuum? Um, to talk about changes in time is to talk about how x, these things that are measured by the various clocks, changes as a function of x. It's a derivative. Time is a derivative. Well, for some set of these devices that evolve, a tentative definition of t puts them in approximate correspondence, although we might need a multiplicative constant in there. And we say of those devices that they're coherent. They change in the same way over time. We use elements from those sets as our clocks. Now, some of the clocks correlate better with the principal component of all of these events than others. And furthermore, they're easy to use. So we take one of these that seems representative of these various scales and calls it our standard. Then what we do is we turn the derivative over and we assert that the change in time is measured by the change in the hands of this standard clock, dt, dx. And furthermore, we say it's constant. That's what Einstein meant, uh, I mean Newton rather, meant when he said time flows equitably. He was making this assertion. And if you have measures of time that don't quite coordinate with that, well, that's too bad because this he called mathematical time, pure and equitable and even flowing. So he asserted what time was. And if your standards were off, if, as the Romans did, their hours stretched and expanded to accommodate the hours in the day, well, you were not then coherent with standard mathematical time. Time becomes what is measured by our standard. It's this network of orderly changes sustained by recalibration at various scales in the universe whose coordination defines what time is. Well, there are different classes of clocks. Class one are clocks that are approximately linear with each other from whom we select a standard, and we, we call standard time. And then we can get from standard time back to one of these local times by a scalar transformation. The time on these clocks then, as it is, as I changed my time coming from Phoenix by two hours, I reset the origin, C. Or, as may be necessary, our grandfather clock is running fast or short, we can either have a lookup, table lookup for what time that really means, as we do with computer clocks, or we can change the knob to recalibrate it. So recalibration is changing the K and resetting or synchronize your watches, gentlemen, for no at noon we go over the hill, is changing C. There's another set of events that evolve through time that are nonlinear with the standard. I'll call these class two, and uh, exponential processes are a good example. They're functional cousins of standard time, and they can map onto one another by exponential um, uh, processes or logarithmic processes, depending on what way you go. One is no more or no less a measure of time 
or a better clock or a worse clock than the other. Then there are other kinds of functions of the standard, such as this sawtooth function. Can anybody tell me uh, what this is a very good model of? What kind of clock? As standard time goes on, this clock keeps linear to some point, then resets and goes linear again. A standard clock, linear up to 12, then boom, falls back to one again, falls back to zero and moves on up again. And these transformations are various. The transformation for the wall clock or standard clock is congruency. The wall clock equals uh, is congruent with the standard time modulo 12 or 24 if you're doing Navy time. So we map back and forth. One constraint on the functions is that they must be monotonic. Here's a non-monotonic function. Why would that not make a good clock? Here we have standard time, time A on the x-axis, and it's reflected off this function on the y-axis. What's wrong with that kind of clock? Multi-valued, which means you'd have time reversals. So it's good for science fiction, little else. Time, so there are constraints on these maps. There are some constraints. They have to be monotonic. Time is what keeps everything from happening out of order, or what's what keeps everything from happening at once, because these have to be monotonic. Although sometimes time can stand still. But you may ask, doesn't time exist as some transcendental universal interval scale of which these are all poor approximations? The answer immediately, no. There's no universal standard interval scale of time. There can't be, uh, even in the mind of Berkeley. With, thanks to Einstein, we know that in a uniformly accelerated gravitational field, all regular processes flow equally. And within that field, time will seem unchanged. Now time will be unchanged. So in an inertial frame, a gravitational time, uh, frame, it will look like time's going on the same as always, but if you're outside that frame, you'll realize, gee, time is changing. It's getting recalibrated. I can change the time on my watch without tinkering with it. There, I've just recalibrated time. That motion changed its scale. It's now set differently than it was set when I set it on the plane. I can change my time this way. My time is now different. It's going slower than yours. Now, it's back to your time again, but C is different. All of us have different motions, different trajectories through this world. All of our times are different from one another, radically different, rescaled, continually reset. Well, how, do, how does one deal with this in terms of then having any kind of coherent relationship between um, one process and another. Well, the, the brilliance of Einstein was to recognize this was a problem not in physics but kinematics and to map between two entities traveling at different velocity. You needed to define the relativistic equations of motion. These are the Lorentz equations. And so you can, with a velocity of b, or I've, I've written it here as, as s, speed I guess, the frequency of a clock um, in this realm equals the frequency of a clock in this realm times 1 minus s, its speed over the speed of light, see, divided by the square root of 1 minus s over c squared. So with this equation, even though my time is continually changing, I can map it onto a simple function using the Lorentz equation. Okay. Well, the... Um, to assert that, that Philip and I keep different times, or that there are different scales of time for all entities in the universe, then becomes not radical, but the reverse is radical. To say that we all have the same is just wrong. We have different times. Just as women have been encouraged to take back the night, psychologists should take back time. Nighttime, daytime, take it back. It's this intrinsically psychological concept. If I could mess with it this well, this easily, why can't I mess with it? By different reinforcement contexts, by different training histories for animals. Why am I not training their times? Why must we give to, to Newton primacy in deciding what time is and naming the standard when we as psychologists have just as much right to think of time not as being 
transformed by animals, but by animals as having their own time intrinsically. Um, so by consensus within physicist gravitational frames, there is a standard time. It's called Newton, Newton's time. It's zeroed at Greenwich. What our task is to ask, what's the appropriate frame for behavior's time? How and where is it zeroed? Within which frames is it scalar? Across which frames does it require nonlinear, relativistic transformations? What are those equations that transform one to the other? If it's anything at all, like the Lorentz equation, what is C? It's not the speed of light. Is it the speed of thought? Is it the speed of behavior? Or is there a completely different relationship between an organism who is accelerated, accelerated by being excited about reinforcement schedules or accelerated by being moved to different contexts? Does that require a complete, completely different map? So our task as scientists is to scientifically characterize the epics of Rosemary's time. Rosemary was uh, Newton's cousin, and she was a simple person. And she, she measured time by daily tasks, and she allowed is how, God, the day has gone very quickly or very slowly, and Newton would chastise her by saying, no, the time always goes the same. It just seems like that. So, but our job as a task is to meaningfully characterize the epics of Rosemary's or a rat's time in life into context within which the clock is a scalar function of the standard time and across which it may be nonlinear. In other words, to sagely parse Rosemary's time. In Turvey's terms, we want to find the number and nature of embedding dimensions in going from context A to context B. Uh, will Hawkins' theorem help? I don't know. How should we go about it? How do we measure behavior's time? And what does it mean to do that? And I'll perceive, as Salvacio did to Simplicio, with a question and answer. Question. Master, does a cat have a clock? Does a cat have moo nature, I guess? Uh, and if so, what class does it belong? A, quan a quancer is um, a rhetorical question. Uh, it's uh, like a lemma in mathematics. A uh, quancer, well, so simplicio, does it embody regular processes that can be correlated with standard time? Of course, sir. Well, give me some examples. Heartbeats, respiration, theta rhythms, tail lickings, the many vibrations that Michael Turvey was talking about a few minutes ago. Answer, then it has what could be properly called clocks. Sir, next question. Does it consult those clocks in order to regulate its behavior? Hmm? How and when do we want to ask do animals time? Well, that's the question that people have presumed an answer to. We can take an operational, a Turing test view of this and say that animals are timing when their behavior is better predicted by our standard clock than by any other events in their environment. Better than by, say, noises from the relay racks, the warmth of the day, the brightness of its light. Well, it's often the case that external cues will help um, an organism to time. Oftentimes, in vegetables, help vegetables to time. Trees shed their leaves when the days grow short. Bears unhibernate when the days grow long again. Um, if I ask you to time this lecture, and afterwards you told me, oh, it's about 45 minutes, 50 minutes, something like that. I said, what do you mean about? Didn't you, have a clock? Didn't, you have a, didn't you use a watch? When we ask people to time, we ask them to use prostheses. If we don't, we'll chastise them or consider them simple. But as psychologists, we'd like to take away the pigeons and the rats' watches and ask them if they can time handicapped, not the way they necessarily evolved to time, but whether they can introspect their own internal clock. Well, what we do know now, I think we know, is that behavior's time is relative. It's relative to the contingencies of reinforcement with which we ask it to read its clock. Um, does it have an internal clock? Yeah, we could do those experiments. We've done it. And we find that its behavior is better oftentimes predicted by time than it is by anything else that's happened in its environment because we've denuded its environment. So we'd want to say it's timing. If it's not consulting an external clock, then it must be an internal one. But which internal one? 
And, and the nature of what that is depends on how you ask the question. Zeiler has shown that if you ask animals to produce an interval of time, they're going to have very different characteristic performances, different Weber fractions, than if you ask them to discriminate intervals of time. There are nonlinearly related clocks that they introspect, if that's what they do. Laura Morgan and, and uh, Greg and I have shown that it depends on the reinforcement context, uh, how quickly their clock is paced. And Weirden has shown that it depends on body heat. Um, so to, to ask what are the nature of these various clocks gets complicated unless we have, as Michael said, a theory that reduces the degrees of freedom to the minimal, that we ask in what are the simplest ways with which we can characterize behavior. It's never wrong to start with a general learning theory assumption or a general timing theory assumption and to find it wrong as advanced because then you find, okay, here's, here's what accounts for most of the behavior and here's the deviation from it that we'll need to take into account for particular cases. So to answer what is the nature of the internal clock requires a theory of timing, theory of clocks. Um, theories of timing are attempts to provide simple transformations of standard time that predict temporal regularities in behavior. So it's an attempt to find the embedding dimensions. Models are useful when some of their properties correspond with the animal's behavior, both within contexts and between contexts. It's our job to find our own Lorentz equa equations. We can ask, what are the responsibilities of models? Those always change with the modeler. I'm, Kuhn said this. We've seen it in the staden hega uh, gibbon debates, uh, Gibbon-Church debates. Um, we can change what the responsibilities are and find that one model accounts for these responsibilities and the other one that, and so you, you go choose. But we can separate the responsibilities into two classes, uh, functional responsibilities and, and structural ones. Um, Einstein's, uh, Einstein, Aristotle's third and fourth causes. Functional questions ask what a thing was designed to do and how did it get to be the way it was? What is the nature of the evolutionary process or the environmental constraints? What problem is the animal solving? And structural questions ask, well, how does it solve it? What machinery does it use to solve these equations? Uh, these models that we craft are often mathematical. Mathematics puts a fine point on the dull pencil of metaphor. But mathematics is often difficult to understand. And so we turn to visual models to help us conceptualize and make our, our models, our mathematical models of machines and hope that the machines will have properties that, are, that embody both the um, characteristics we hope to model of the animal and the characteristics of the mathematical models we apply to them. So one common kind of model, as a very natural one from what we've been talking about, the nature of time, is a pacemaker counter system. And the pacemakers come from these different classes of events uh, that evolve over time. The best kind to use are those that are periodic. Some have low variability like crystals or medium variability like clock pendulums or high variabilities like uh, the amount of radium left in a sample as a function of time. Um, the device that changes with time is called a pacemaker. It's a subset of the things that evolve with time for which dvdt is not equal to zero. And these kinds of clocks solve um, problems, functional problems. I mean, if we address briefly the functions, what are the problems biological clocks must solve? They tell us when something has to be done or was done. They tell us when to get up, to eat our porridge, to write the paper, to go home, to go to bed. This means they have to be, we, we have to be going from a state of not yet time to go home to now go home. What we need is a binary decision oftentimes. We don't need much more than a binary decision. So our, the functional job of most clocks is to partition the temporal continuum into two states and to discriminate amongst these states. For many cases, that's all we need to know. So many of the theories of timing that have evolved and make rats and pigeons little Seiko or Casio wristwatches are over, overly specifying what the beast can do when you just need a binary decision. This was the point of Staden and Higgins that we don't need a pacemaker counter system because behavior is much simpler than that would allow, and so we've got a model that's too good. And we'll come back to this theme of models that are too good in a moment. So amongst these uh, structural models, uh, we have the PC type, that's pacemaker counter, and we have um, non-PC models. 
real-time models such as sundials and delay lines, SMIX and Grossberg spectral timer. Reed has a, uh, a Raleigh model of uh, the timing process that apparently doesn't use counters. Uh, Staden and Higa's MTS. I was going to discuss those, but I'm running out of time to do that, and so we'll pass that up and talk about the PC models, the politically correct ones. There's a whole bunch of them, and um, I'm going to go through them very quickly. I'm going to name them is what I'm going to do. Well, okay, I've, I've already said this, that machines that time are useful go-betweens between the behavior of an animal and the behavior of mathematics, and they help us throw light back on the mathematics and forward on the animal. Next one. So some pacemaker counter models is Treisman's original PC model, Gibbon and Church's scalar expectancy theory, Mayan Gregg's behavioral theory of timing, Machado's learning to time, Church and Broadbent's multiple oscillator model, Church's modular model, and a mathematical model of me and uh, Neil Weiss. So those are some, and they keep proliferating, and that's not bad. If people are looking to models as being like E equals MC squared or F equals MA, like, geez, why are you suggesting on an equation if you're going to change it next year? Don't understand that models are, are means, not ends. The goal is not to generate a, um, a math model. The generator is to use mathematics to enlighten the phenomenon. And if uh, it's set forever, then it's not doing its job. So models must evolve or they stop being useful. And there should be a competition amongst models, a Darwinian competition. Unfortunately, sometimes there's, let's say, what, sexual selection as well as functional selection. Sometimes, you know, that damn peahen runs off the guy with the bigger tail even though you could fly better. And so you have to filter this through uh, a lot of gloss. And you, as a consumer, have to decide whether, you know, what you want out of a model. Maybe what you want is sex appeal. And uh, a wise person tries to throw a little bit of that gratuitous sex appeal into models that are basically functionally effective. Um, let's see what's next. This is now, now we're getting into terra incognita. Okay, so here is a logo for all of these models almost. Uh, this comes from Church, Mech, and Gibbon, and it symbolizes the pacemaker sending pulses. Pulses could be regular or they could be random to a switch which connects it with a counter or accumulator, same difference. That sends uh, the information to a comparator, and the animal checks reference memory. And all this means to them is that, hmm, it's about this long. Now, is that long enough? Let me see, was that long enough? That's what this box is. And um, long enough. Well, if you're really hungry, you might have a low threshold for saying yes, and like on a fixed interval schedule, start real early. Or if you're not hungry, or if the job is very difficult, you might have a high threshold. And you make a decision, you go to low state or high state. This really symbolizes the guts of most of the models. Uh, Greg and my model had random pulses coming out of here because it was simple to do the math and we're not as good as Gibbon. And um, we had the speed of this vary with the uh, animal's arousal because we thought clocks sped up when the animals were excited. And that generated a reasonable model of behavior, although like all models, it's not a perfect model. It has failures. Um, what um, Church and uh, what uh, Church, Mac, Gibbon have done is focus on this part. That's why they call it information processing. There's not too much action actually here. It's a lot of action in errors coming out of reference memory, errors uh, consulting it, errors in making comparison. So all their actions down there. Church and Broadbent um, uh, with their um, lovely multiple oscillator model have thrown away the accumulator and replaced it with a bank of counters, if you would that they then cross-correlate and ask the same sorts of questions. Uh, Armando Machado has taken BET, and he's given us, instead of a simple um, all or none, uh, one behavior being associated with reinforcement, and either behave then or not, a, a sort of panoply of things that get conditioned with time, very reasonable dynamic generalization of behavioral theory of timing. So what he's talking about is how the conditioning occurs. He's added a learning module to this. What uh, Church has been trying to do lately is saying, look, there's a lot of good in all of these. How do we take a model that is most parsimonious in general and take, a, let's say, a pacemaker that we think is representative, an accumulator-type device, put them together? He's actually going to do a genetic algorithm of putting these together in all combinations and see which one does best. 
uh, problem with that is the question is what do you mean does best? Um, against what are the criteria with which you will test this? And um, those are interesting questions. Uh, maybe, maybe you should vote. Maybe you should write to church and say they have to preserve thus and such character of behavior. Um, so what are the, um, some of the properties that we would uh, like to compare models against behavior or math models against physical models against behavior? One is bias. Is the scalar constant, remember all the clocks within a realm are calibrated with some constant. The units are always arbitrary, seconds, minutes, k will vary with that. But is that constant, is that scalar constant constant? Is it constant at one, so it's linear with real time? Or do the animals always underestimate real time? Is it constant across an experiment? Or does it change within an experiment? For Church and Gibbon, Gibbon and Church, K, K is, <coughs> pardon me, K, the, the value of K determines what comes in and out of memory. So they buy in certain features with that. Precision, you can ask, what's the variance of this scalar constant? Um, does it depend on T? Now remember, we're going back to this other uh, model where you have these classes of models. And so what you're doing is asking now about what, uh, what class do these belong to and what are the properties of these key um, parameters in these models. Um, we can ask about bias, about precision, about operation. Can they be paused, stopped, and reset? Can, can C be reset to zero by experimental operations? Uh, are they portable? Can you time tones and then find that the animal also knows how to ta time lights or time predator arrivals? Can they be recalibrated? Can you train them to change the value of K? Can they take a licking and keep on ticking? No, I don't know. Maybe we don't need that property. Well, we could do drugs, I guess. I don't know. So you can think of properties that a real clock has, you know, and say, are these properties that I want to investigate and that I want to ask a model to be responsible for? Should it predict the whole stream of behavior or some parts of the stream of behavior? Beautiful work from the, uh, the, the Brown Church group um, on these operational questions. Can you stop a watch? Can you get it going again? I'm not going to go into these. These are going to be sort of icons rather than graphs, so don't expect me to understand them. Just have a visual image of them. But if you put breaks in the timing process in various ways, you can get animals to stop their clock or to start it. It doesn't matter where the breaks are, but you shift the behavioral performance by the same amount that you ask them to stop the clock for. So these questions about functional operation have been addressed. Um, none of the questions are answered, so they're good ones. The questions about scaling and asking them to time something, it's the Mech Church and Gibbon, asking them to time something and count something. It turns out that if you presume when they're counting, they're timing the intervals of signals that they're counting, and you assign a value of 200 milliseconds minimal to those times, you can bring in correspondence the uh, psychometric functions, the bias points beautifully by assuming that counting is a version of timing or vice versa, which is some reinforcement for the pacemaker counter model. You can take an animal that's learned to time very accurately, so the probability of saying long is about 50% where it should be. Take it out of the context, uh, give it lots of food in the context of the signal, or put it in extinction in the context of the signal. No timing possible. Put it back in the context, and you've recalibrated its, its timer. It thinks time is going much faster if it had a recent reinforcement history with that signal. It thinks it's going much slower, and it washes out over uh, 10 blocks of over 80 trials that'll watch, wash out again back to neutrality. So you can recalibrate the watch out of context. That's it, okay. Um, well, there's an interesting problem that all pacemaker counter clocks have. They're too good. Not too good in mapping against data but too good in terms of mapping against standard time. Animals aren't so good at that. We can measure how good they are by looking at the standard deviation and finding out how the standard deviation changes as a function of number of ticks on the clock or, or real time. And we'll find that uh, for many animals, the standard in many contexts, the standard deviation might start above zero a bit, but then it's approximately linear over a large range. That's Weber's law or scalar timing. 
any of these devices that I've shown you and talked about can arbitrarily increase their accuracy by speeding up the pacemaker, even if it's irregular. It can be as irregular as possible, and that's a Poisson process. Knowing when a count occurs gives you no information about when the next one's going to occur. So it's a really minimalistic pacemaker, but make it fast enough, and you have an arbitrarily accurate clock. And so that as the number of ticks or the amount of time goes by, the standard deviation relative to the mean keeps dropping in one of these devices. That's why our watches go at such fast rates. That's why the Accutron had a tuning fork going at, I don't know, 20 kilohertz or whatever it was. So one of the jobs of all of these timing models we've talked about um, is to add noise, add variance in ways that saves um, this, um, this linear increase in the standard deviation. Now, John Gibbon calls that scalar timing, and it's slight. It's different than what I mean. By, by what I mean is you can put it in correspondence by multiplication by a constant. But an aspect of Gibbon's version of scalar timing theory is that Weber's law. He assumes Weber's law. He builds it into the model in terms of uh, counter error. And by the way, in this thing that, that Weiss and I did, we showed that for any kind of, within a class of pacemaker counter systems, the only way that you can get Weber law error uh, is to, to, to place that error in the counter. You can't get it by placing it in the pacemaker. There's no, there's no way you can detune a pacemaker counter system adequately by putting the error in the pacemaker. You've got to muck with the counter a bit. And so solutions to that have been, of course, green the counter in the sense that um, you could, what you can do is assume that you can only count so far, so in context where things are happening fast, you count faster. You know how life speeds up in the big city and everybody talks faster back there and it's really hard to take time and listen to people that talk slowly when you're back on the East Coast and when you're out in the West. It's a lot better, partner. People look, the, look you in the eye. They say what they mean. I've never understood what that is. <laughs> but you understand it. You hear it. So anyhow, uh, Greg and I had the clock speed change with the richness of the environment because that tuned the animal to regularities in its environment and made use of ceilings on counters. You don't want to go too fast in a slow environment. You'll use up the counter. You'll go modulo, congruent modulo, or whatever. So it's tuning. Other ways of doing it is putting error in the counting process as scalar expectancy theory does. Another way is of dropping counts. The counts don't always get to the uh, counter. They come out of the pacemaker and get lost. Well, they can get lost in various ways. And this is research of my own that I'm having fun with lately. Um, think, think of, here's another physical model of a behavioral process, and it has, it started with this, and then I went on to a mathematical model of this. Think of counting um, as incrementing a unit's counter or bucket until it's full. It dumps into a tens bucket until it's full. And you've seen these devices sometimes as uh, mobile art with water pouring in and this going fast and this slower and this slower. You can make a clock out of them. And what you can do is think of this as uh, going from different states. Uh, state B sub 0, B sub 1, B sub 2. B is base. So this could be 10 to the 0 or units. 10 to the ones or tens, 10 squared or hundreds. Or it could be a binary cascade where this is 2. So this would be value 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. Now, if you put error in here only, drop it going into the, into the counter, you wind up with another Poisson timing system. It's, a, it's what's called Bernoulli error, and it looks just like, um, just like the kinds of things that, that pacemaker counter systems have looked like all along. You can't tell whether it's just a noisier pacemaker or whether you're losing counts going into the counter. So, um, so there's potential model of cascades, such as the events could be ticks from a metronome or they could be world events. And we're asking what happens when P is less than 1. In the case one I just mentioned, where only the first there's only splashes in those buckets going from the first to the second, or going from the input to the first, and all the others are accurate. You just get Bernoulli counting. It looks just like all the other darn things, and it's too good. 
But suppose you put error at each of those stages. There can be a little splash at each of those stages. You could occasionally run into trouble. You could occasionally do, make a big mistake, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 19, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 19, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. You've dropped a whole decade. Or you could drop a whole hundred. So these are curious devices in which you will have occasional catastrophic error. Occasionally, you'll fail to reset. It's like an odometer on an old car. You'll fail to reset the next um, order of magnitude. And you've reset everything else, you're back to square one again. So what does the behavior of something like that look like? Let's suppose a very tiny error, 97% probability of correctly transmitting the information. That's pretty darn good for a biological system. And if you plot the average uh, count registered as a function of the number of inputs, you'll get what looks almost linear. If you look real close, you'll find this goes up, and there's a little bit of a, a jag down here, and then it goes up again here, and there's a little bit of a jag down. But it's not bad. But the slope has fallen. The slope is not anywhere near 97%. It's only 85%. So you're losing a lot of information because of those occasional catastrophic errors, even though the probability of them is only 3%. And you're also getting a few little wiggles there, a few little wrinkles. Well, if you look at the lovely work of Church, Collier, and his associates, Broadbent, and you plot the mean time of rats as a function of the interstimulus interval they've been trained to respond at, you get similar minuscule deviations from a straight line. And if you plot the residuals from the straight line, you get a signature. With Russ, Russ and others, is called the oscillator signature. Well, with this uh, counting cascade with error at each stage, you can replicate these kind of residual errors perfectly. I think even more fun is what happens with the standard deviation. Although we now have closed form solutions for this, that is a mathematician, Tom Taylor, I'm working with does, the simulations get the job done just fine. So these are simulations with probabilities of successfully transmitting information of 97% and 99%, and I'm plotting the standard deviation of the counts registered as a function of the number of input pulses. And we have step functions. Why? What's happening right as you go from 16 to 17, or 15 to 16? all of a sudden there's a chance that you're going to blow it and go back to, to zero. Very small chance, but it really kicks the standard deviation of received counts way up. Within these treads, this increase is logarithmic. Between the treads, it's a step function up. The envelopes are straight lines. Straight lines mean the standard deviation is a linear function of the number of input pulses, the straight lines are Weber fractions of Weber's law, instances of Weber's law. On the, on the small scale, you have a logarithmic relationship between variability and time. And whenever you force the system to go over to a new order of magnitude, you have a jump function up. Well, that's pretty, but you know, there aren't any data like that, are there? Chris Christofferson did these beautiful experiments like Ebbinghaus on himself and other people, where he spent months uh, making dis discrimination judgments of base durations around 200, 400, on up to over almost two seconds. Very small changes in them until he could get measures of standard deviation. This is essentially a standard deviation score. This is his graph. What's notable is that the length of each of these doubles and the step up doubles. And that's also exactly a characteristic of our uh, counting cascades with error. So the simple model that we've had all along, the Poisson counting model, that says that um, counting is perfect, pacemaker can be lousy, and a counter is perfect, of course needed to be relaxed in biological systems. This is one way of relaxing it. There are other neat ways of relaxing it. You can say that if this is sum and fire architecture, the more that you try to put on a single neuron before, the higher the threshold is, the flatter the exponential approach is. And so you'll have a different relationship between uh, error and its growth.
But this one, this simple one, where all p's are equal and very high, this is nice. I fit these data, both with closed form and simulation, perfectly, essentially, with a p-value of 0.98. Very good piece of information. Does the job for us. So, back to the nature of time. Back to the outline. Time isn't out there. Time isn't something that just steamrolls along and we poor psychologists have to try and find some way of dealing with it. Time is ours. It's intrinsically relative. It changes each time you move. Why not have it change each time you think? Why should not physicists come to recalibrate their time by our time? Well, that was not going to happen. But I think we have to take for real that we have as valid a sense of if Rosemary's time seems to be going faster, Rosemary's time is going faster. It's our job to find the equations of motion and the context. Physicists found that it was motion that did the trick. With equally, with inertial frames that are moving with equal velocity, all standard clocks are scalar within them. But to get from one context to another, you needed a Lorentz transformation. What are our equivalent contexts? We don't really quite know yet, although a Skinner box is a pretty sort of basic one. That needs to be asked. And what are our equations of motion between contexts? I don't know. The timing models we have are attempting to answer what's the equations of correspondence within one context, and will often fail when you put them in new contexts. That shouldn't come as a surprise or a condemnation of the model. That's the way the world is in physics. Why shouldn't that be the way the world is for us? Do animals have clocks? By the definition that we can put their behavior in correspondence with a uh, standard clock, yes, they, they have clocks, and their clocks are sometimes predicated on reading the, the hands on a watch, just like ours are. They read the time in the day by the warmth, the heat, the sun, uh, the sounds. And other times they do it without those prostheses, and so we might want to say they have internal clocks as well. They serve different functions. We can't understand them as models without also understanding what problems they solve. They're not solving the same problem of us whether Bill should next say two or three or four, they're solving different kinds of problems for which they need perhaps less accuracy, oftentimes more. That models of timing are attempts not to tell you the truth about final characterizations, but they're tools. They can be used as visual icons or as math models. It would be nice if they were coherent. I didn't show you some of the modeling games that people have played. When you have a model like that, you can stress it in different ways. Add an extra signal before the others. Switch context, switch counting timing. Those are fun things to talk about the operational properties. The data are tremendously rich and good. And again, see uh, uh, Higa's editions of uh, behavioral processes if you want to get a sense of them. And then the signatures of counters. Now finally, I think, has been assumed that there are either perfect or they always drop a count, i.e. always really just Bernoulli. And now with this new model of liberating what we take as a counter, where it can have error from one stage to the next, we might be able to put more of the work into the counter and offload some of these pacemaker models quite a bit. So now we can all go home and parsley sage our own and Rosemary's time. Thank you. Bob's not trying to tell me to sit down so I can answer any questions or I can avoid them. Alan. Imagine a box with five green and tomatoes in it. That's going faster and faster. Now, in terms of our time, tomatoes are going to turn red slow as it goes faster. And they're going to get heavy. Well, how do you know? Because you have to keep up with them to inspect them after the case. I may be wrong on this, but I think they're the fact that they're five remains the same. If that's the case, then how can you use digital events to, as the basis for time? Because what drives them is not digital. It does not need to be digital. It can, be di it can put out pulses, but the interval between pulses it can be a continuously variable function of time as a function of velocity. If I 
stack correctly, what you're doing is counting rather than using an analog. Absolutely. So if you're counting, yes. count stays constant. Yes. It takes you longer to get to a particular count the faster you get. But the count is constant. Yes. Thus, if you're using counted, yes. then your timing can't be relevant. No, because the pacemaker, if you're, oh, if you're counting external events, perhaps not. But if you're counting any device that in a uh, physical sense has mass, and all pendula, all oscillatory mechanisms have mass, then they're going to oscillate more slowly. So the input to the counters will be slowed down. The counting process can be inviolate, but the oscillations have got to slow as you accelerate the body. So time will slow down. But the tomatoes will get green slower. I think Alan was establishing the fact that counts don't change, that numbers don't change as things advance. And then the next question that Jack is bringing up is that that's, however, different from a pacemaker counter ensemble. Go on, please. Well, in other words, when you're talking about counts, you're talking about a set of sequential events. The five tomatoes is not a set of sequential events. It's simply five tomatoes. Because you point out yeah. the only way to comprehend time is simply a set of sequential events. Yes. Which we recognize as one, in other words, coming before another. Mm -hmm. One day after the other. That's right. That's not the yeah. way Unless they're happening all at once. We see them all at once. That's right. Of course, some of these have parallel counters, but that's a different story. Michael? Is it right to assume that the events are sequential? Ecologically speaking, events are less than. So right now, there's a variety of events taking place within uh, time scales of other events, which are longer time scales. I haven't brought with me a marvelous overhead because you'd have to take it completely on faith rather than partially on faith. But this model that I have is a recurrent process. And if you draw the Markov state transition diagrams, there's a beautiful visual symmetry with loops within pairs of counters, quadruplets of counter, eights of counters, sixteens of counters. And it's a process which revisits the origin periodically as long as p is less than one. So it is the accumulation of a sequence of nested processes. If you plot its eigenvalues in the real plane, they're fractal objects. We have a description of their Julia set. And so these counters are not merely erroneous counters. They're counters with these marvelous fractal dimension properties. Uh, and they do have nested hierarchies of, of action in them. What I haven't yet shown is F1 noise with them, but I don't know if I can. So yeah. Uh, embeddedness and hierarchies is really the great name of the game, and dealing with that is a, a beautiful problem. Time, time, time. Time is on my mind, on my side. Do you think that the system of yours would count the time that an animal might judge that it spent mating um, in the same way that? It of the time that it spent waiting for food. Greg, what do you think? The time it spent singing a song versus the time it spent um, uh, drinking. Or I don't think so. I think that uh, you... I yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I think that uh, there's no question in my intuition, about my intuition, that time goes faster when animals are consuming reinforcers or vigor vigorously engaged in acquiring them, it goes more slowly in context where there's less action. And for any limited capacity device, that makes a lot of functional sense. Maybe not maiden. Maybe not maiden. Oh god, this is taking forever. When will it end? <laughs> <laughs> Jack? Uh, I have an objection to saying that an animal has a problem, which implies that then the animal What's really the case here is that the animal acts as if it were a clock, yeah. operating under different systems. The, the, 
We only see the animal as a clock, not that it has one. We only see an animal as a clock, not as though it has one. That's correct. And then the question is, if you want to parse the mechanical, this is a third Aristotle cause because the reductionistic mechanistic basis of it, uh, then you might ask, well, yes, the animal is acting as a clock. We could agree on that. But to say it has a clock requires uh, other assumptions. But you might want to say, look, it's tail feathers have got nothing to do with it, and you've scientifically shown that's the case. So you can, you can reduce the aspect of the animal that's at all relevant to the timing process to a subset of what it is or how it behaves. And in that sense, you might want to talk about the entity as a whole, as a pigeon, of which part constitutes a clock, which it might or might not consult. Right. I don't think any of these models really address that issue. That's because these are, these are formal, these are, these, are, these are Aristotle's formal becauses, there are four, uh, efficient, formal, final, and functional. And these are models, formal models of the process. Newton's greatest sorrow was that he couldn't do a mechanistic hook in the eye, uh, reductionistic explanation of gravity. All he could offer were naked equations of motion that worked great, but it was not the, he was a mechanical philosopher. It's not what he wanted. He wanted to know what the machinery of gravity was about. And it was his accomplishment not only to show it, but to change the standards for what a demonstration is from a reductionistic, mechanistic, hook and eye model of explanation to a formal model of explanation. So these are formal causes, but no, they're not causes of, about what the parts of the animal are. That's a different inquiry that might be put in correspondence with it, I hope, but it's a different inquiry. Hey, Joe. It, it seems to me that, that if, if arousal varies, but remains constant through you know, one observation period, many animals learn something, um, so that it's speeding up each step being the change in speed is constant across the time. It's just that uh, it's faster than it might be in another context. It's, it's just faster from some observation. You're observing the animal climbing it. Okay. Okay. And it's more around from one of your observations. Within the interval, or across the. Okay, four and so. Here's interval A, the animal's turned on, and interval B is not, a multiple schedule, perhaps. Then we find he's really psyched in interval A. OK. Right. Then you present the interval again, so you're doing another observation. Mm -hmm. And it's more or less exciting. So yes. it's the uh, confident accumulation that going on there, so we're OK, there's, so there's noise in the ex excitatory arousal clock maker acceleration process. Good, go on. So that, that, that then produces a, a correlation between these That's right. That's right. And that will produce that the standard deviation If yes, if they're positively correlated, part of part of MOM, multiple oscillator model of uh, of uh, broadband, Hillary Broadband and Church, is to assume that a noise gets added to all of their oscillators at the same time. So that gives that gives you Weber's law. So you're right. Another way of getting but then wouldn't that follow your assumption that the source of that noise could be the the arousal. Uh, what Joel has demonstrated is, is that Greg and I may have been right originally in our behavioral theory of timing, where Weber's law comes from noise in the arousal mechanism, pacemaker mechanism, and you might not need this kind of counter error to achieve it. Thank you. That's, I think that's right. And you, and you can find out, because we believe that many mediating behaviors act as the counter in our theory. You know, yes, what is the counter? The counter is what the animal's doing. If he's doing this, then that's count one. If he's doing this, it's count. And what that means is these behaviors have been conditioned to then, if the lights come on and says it's long or short, it says, well, I don't know. I was pacing the wall. And whenever I'm pacing the wall, peck the right key, I get reinforced. But whenever I'm hanging around the hopper and the lights come on, I peck the left key and I get reinforced. So the behavior itself is a counter. Uh, now, that doesn't even mean the animal has ordinal understanding of these, because you could have things that are separate. All it knows is what gets conditioned. And so there, the, uh, the counter is an external. It's not external. It's behavior itself. 
Well, thank you for spending your time with us.